Hi everybody, this is Peter Schiff. It's Friday, May 29th, 2009. Well, this has been an incredible uh, day, week, a month in, in the markets. Uh, first of all, the dollar uh, got hammered again today, one of the biggest down days yet. Uh, the dollar index, I think, closed around uh, 79 and a quarter, decisively now below that 80 level. We've dropped now about 12% from the peak uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, commodity prices continue to surge. Uh, oil prices, I closed uh, the month, I think, at 66 and a half. I think this is the biggest weekly or monthly gain in oil prices in over 10 years. Uh, silver surged. Gold surged. You know, silver now, I, I heard on television, this is the biggest monthly gain in silver in 23 years. Uh, so we have surging commodity prices. Also this week, we had a collapse in the bond market. Interest rates moved up substantially. Uh, it, it, in addition, uh, we got more economic news coming from abroad that, you know, the economic conditions outside the United States are not nearly as bad as people thought. So the week was very, very strong in foreign stock markets. Uh, U.S. stocks didn't do much, but they managed to eke out small gains on the month, despite the fact that other markets around the world uh, recorded spectacular gains, especially when you factor in uh, the, the, the currencies. You know, and looking at the momentum, you know, I think we're going to continue to get more dollar weakness from here. I think we're going to see further strength in commodities. I think the bond market is going to continue to get clobbered, which means interest rates are going to keep rising, despite the fact that the U.S. economy is going to continue to deteriorate. And this is basically my entire scenario playing out exactly the way I wrote about it in Crash Proof and in the little book and what I've been saying all along, that our economic collapse would be accompanied by uh, falling bonds, which means rising interest rates, increasing commodity prices, higher inflation, a weakening dollar, and decoupling where foreign economies and foreign markets did well uh, relative to the U.S. That's exactly what's happening. You know, I took a lot of heat again late last year when it appeared that that wasn't going to happen, or at least that's the conclusion that a lot of people prematurely jumped to. But actually, everything is happening the way I said. There was that little a head fake, or and I and I described it that way when it was happening. I mean, it's basically like a uh, like a football player running back. He wants to run right, so he fakes left, and by faking left, he throws off the defense, and they run one way, and then he goes the other way. And basically, what happened is the market faked deflation, and now it's running inflation. Meanwhile, the defense that bought into that head fake is now caught flat-footed. They're looking back and they're watching the running back running towards the end zone, and they're scrambling uh, to catch him, which means everybody's got to get rid of their deflation trades and get into the inflation trades. The deflation trades are the dollar and bonds. The inflation trades are foreign currencies, commodities, gold, foreign stocks, everything that people sold in late 2008 because they got fooled by the deflation now they're rushing to buy all that stuff back. And I've never in my career, I've been a broker now for over 20 years, I've been following this particular strategy for only about 10, but I've never seen it work this well as far as short-term gains. I've never seen the stocks that I was buying rise so dramatically in such short periods of time. And it's kind of ironic because at the very time that the Wall Street Journal ran that article in January about how poorly my investment strategy had performed in 2008. And when all the blogosphere was abuzz with these allegations of, oh, look how much Schiff's clients are down in 2008. At the very moment when my investment strategy came under the most criticism, it was actually the best time to have fully embraced it. At least judging by the short-term results in 2009, 2009 has been the best year in my career for foreign stocks, for foreign currencies, for commodities, for precious metals. It's the best year for anything that I've done. Now, granted, people that adopted my investment strategy, uh, many of them in 2007 and early 2008, a lot of those people, their accounts are still down, but they're not down anywhere near as much as they were. In fact, very few of my accounts would be down even as much as the S&P, even the accounts who were down the most. And of course, clients whose accounts were only down 20 or 30% or 40%, most of those guys are now positive. And it's amazing how quickly uh, those paper losses were made up based on the speed at which things have turned around. And of course, anybody who really followed my advice and took advantage of the decline 
and added to their accounts uh, in late 08, uh, early 09, or anybody who started brand new, who knew enough not to believe uh, what was being written and what was being uh, said about my investment strategy, if they understood what was really going on and they adopted that strategy in the face of all that criticism, I mean, they're sitting on enormous short-term gains. Now, I have no idea what's going to happen for sure because I'm not advising that any of my clients sell. I'm not advising that any of my clients, you know, realize any short-term gains. So who knows? Maybe the markets will pull back. But I have a strong feeling that they won't because so many people are going the wrong way that I think it's more likely that we don't get a meaningful pullback. And uh, I think a lot of people are caught on the sidelines uh, wishing they haven't sold uh, and they're, they're, they're in a bad position. Uh, and I think it could be before the end of this year that the dollar is actually at total new lows, that gold is, you know, and gold could be at new highs by next week. I mean, gold, you know, almost at a thousand right now. Gold stocks, I mean, gold, the Huey index traded above 400 today. It was at 150 in October, from 150 to 400. Most of the gold stocks in that index have tripled. Many of them are up four and 500 percent. And the irony of it is they're still off their highs because the, the Huey was at 500 at its peak. But even if you bought the absolute peak, you're, you, you know, you're, you're, what are you down now? 20%, 25%? The S&P is down 43%. And of course, anybody who added to their positions is, is, you know, is, is thankful for that decline, which, you know, which I did personally. You know, also, too, I want to talk about what's going on. A lot of people this week are talking about the risk of inflation because they're seeing what's happening in the bond market. And the way the Fed is reacting in most of the media they're saying, well, this is all OK because interest rates are rising because the economy is getting better. And so if the economy is getting better, you would expect rates to rise. Well, how do they know that that's why they're rising? I think it's far more likely that rates are rising because of inflation, because uh, our creditors see how much money we're printing, how much debt we're assuming, and they don't want any part of it. And it's inflation expectations that are driving rates, rates higher. It's the weak dollar. It's not some phony, non-existent economic recovery. And of course, I also hear these analysts talking about the fact that the Fed is going to be able to remove all this excess liquidity to make sure that it doesn't create any inflation. Well, this is all utter nonsense. I mean, theoretically, the way they would have to remove this liquidity is the Fed would have to take all those toxic assets that they bought and sell them back to the private market and take back all the cash they put in. Well, how are they going to do that? Who's going to buy all these toxic assets? And if they try to ram these toxic assets back into the economy, then everything they tried to prevent, the entire collapse they tried to prevent by buying them, well, now we're going to relive it, only worse. So this is nonsense. Now, the argument is, well, when the economy recovers, the assets won't be toxic anymore. But that's impossible. They're, they're always going to be toxic. That's the problem. I mean, real estate prices are only at current levels because of the Fed's policy, because of the artificially low rates. The minute the Fed tries to remove that excess liquidity and force interest rates up, then real estate prices come crashing down and the assets are just as toxic if ever, if not more so. The same thing with the credit card debt and the auto loans it is all a bluff. There is no way to remove this liquidity and I think they know it. I think the Fed's only game plan is that they think if they just create enough inflation that wages can rise and salaries can rise to the point where homes are now affordable. But that's not going to work. Wages and salaries are going to be the last prices to rise in this inflation, especially with all the people losing their jobs. What's going to happen is people's wages are going to continue to lose value relative to the price of everything else. And of course, the price of food, the price of energy, the price of clothing, all these prices are going to rise long before the price of houses ever rise. So this is massive inflation. This is not an economic recovery. And that's what the precious metals market is telling you. That's what the bond market is telling you. And that's what the currency markets are telling you. Also, I want to quickly mention, it looks like this GM bankruptcy is now going to be official. I think they're going to file on, on, on Monday. The stock is trading well below a dollar. You know, I was watching uh, on, on television the labor unions when they're, they're talking about all the concessions they've made. And, you know, this is all nonsense. What about the concessions the owners have made? They get completely wiped out. Of course, the bondholders are going to take a hit as well. I don't see big concessions in part of the labor unions. They're not giving back all the salaries, the, the higher salaries that they earn. Uh, they're getting stock in the company. And also, apparently now GM, based on union demands, is now going to manufacture more small cars in America. Uh, they, did, they weren't doing it before because they couldn't do it profitably. But now that GM is going to be owned by the government, they don't care less about making profits. They're going to produce cars at losses, and that's part of the problem. Anyway, I'm running out of time on this clip. I'll be back again next week. So long.